unidentifiable flying object. <laughs> UFO continues to be a mystery. Wasn't alone in space. Sightings of UFOs. Something out there. <laughs> Close enough to be observed. What could it be? It could only be one thing. A UFO. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of UFO No. Your break from the propaganda, the bad news, the treasonous politicians. Time to get elevated with my new friend, Hermes Oslander. I'm telling you, this guy is fucking rad. <laughs> I had so much fun. Uh, and if you're not guessing by the name, uh, yeah, it, it, I thought it was going to be weird too. I know. I really, really did. I thought it was going to be weird. I thought he was going to be a weird guy when I first ran into him. I, I read his bio, talks about being an alien, and I really was like, what is this guy all about? And I had to know. I had to know. And uh, I found out today, and he is a super badass individual. We had so much, such a great conversation. I mean, we went through everything that you could imagine from – the UFO topic to, you know, paranormal supernatural stuff to uh, his show, the Scuttlebutt podcast, the copyrighted, the Scuttlebutt podcast is he made sure to tell me that. And, uh, and anyways, amazing guy. And so we went over everything, even to the point where we got into the world's problems deep. I mean, we went deep into our feelings on, you know, his feelings, my feelings on what the world's problems are. And you know what we even did? We even attempted to throw out some possible solutions. And I'm going to give you a little clue. One of them, one of them, it's not even a clue. I'm just going to tell you. One of them was ayahuasca. And it's not our original idea. This was Graham Hancock's idea. Give everybody ayahuasca. I love it. I haven't done it myself. Uh, Hermes had, and I was so excited to talk to him about his experience. And so after talking to him, I'm like, dude, I'm booking a trip to Peru and I hate to break it to you, Hermes, but it's going to be a, a bit, <laughs> it's going to be a little while before I'm able to go Peru. Uh, but I definitely absolutely want to, but, uh, anyways, what a super fun, just stream of consciousness we had, uh, in this conversation. I mean, I had, uh, a handful of questions prepared, didn't use a single one of them, not a single one of them. We were able to just go and, and where it went, it was so great, so great, so much fun. One of the longest podcasts I've done so far on this show, over two and a half hours. So anyways, I thoroughly hope you enjoy this podcast because I really did and I can't wait to do it again uh, with Hermes. Have him back on, and hopefully I can do his show, the Scuttlebutt Podcast. Be so much fun! But wow, what a blast! Anyways, I want to thank you all for joining the show. I'm in the stratosphere, cruising about 147,000 feet, and it's clear skies, baby. If you like the show, be sure to share this episode. Give a nice review, five stars. Looks amazing. And so good and nice and wholesome all up against all the other five stars. So hit that subscribe button and follow button if you're on YouTube. Anywhere that allows you to follow, subscribe, review. It really helps the show grow as well as some other things that you could do. Check out the links in the show notes. Ways to support the podcast. We want your stories. We want your experiences. We want you to reach out. So call or text 208 208- Four seven seven one two eight eight. You can also email I want to believe one one five at gmail.com. Uh, but without further ado, I bring to you Hermes Oslander. Tell me about your uh, tell the people who you are, what about your podcast, the Scuttlebutt podcast, and uh, what you're all about, man. Hell yeah. Well, I appreciate you having me on, Ben. I don't know yeah. if we hit record or not. I'm just going to let you. I've listened to quite a few, so I'm just going to let you do your thing. Appreciate that. And uh, I'm, I'm going to follow your lead. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah man, the, it's uh, actually the only 
um, trademarked and copywritten the Scuttlebutt podcast all together there because uh, you'll notice if you ever Google or you know search for it, there's you know what's the Scuttlebutt or just Scuttlebutt or you know just uh, Scuttlebutt podcast. You know you see all these variations out there. Oh, okay, and we're the only I would say bad boys, as one of our co-hosts likes to say, <laughs> where we're kind of the renegade, as you even said, you know more of the pirate radio vibe about us where. You know, we have no rules. It's in our intro, and it's um, two thirds of us are active duty military. So, nice. parts of the things that we talk about, um, we can't talk about in uniform. So, we definitely had to go that pirate radio renegade route. I and see. So, yeah, hence why you're only talking to a hand on screen yeah. over here, <laughs> <laughs> and not and not uh, this awful radio face that probably is attached to these voice these vocals. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's kind of what we do. You know, we go all over the all over the map. We you know interview other people you know as as often as we can whoever's brave enough to jump up and you know test their sea legs if you will uh we we just shoot the shit with each other about you know military life or maybe just the latest things that's going on in the news you know um we all have different interests so we kind of bring a different perspective myself being more you know like art heavy creation heavy you know reading a lot we have uh, a co-host morpheus he's into like uh games workshop miniatures you know um uh, 40k uh whatever that game is. Oh, yeah, Warhammer. Warhammer. I was blanking on the name, and he's going to hate me for doing it because he brings <laughs> it up all the time. <laughs> but he loves he loves his minis. He loves video games. And then we have the third co-host, the main, the uh, the third, I guess, um, leg of the tripod uh, there, and he's our residential civilian. And he brings more of, like, the technical side, the video side, the um, virtual reality side. He got us both, like, into virtual reality. And as we meld all to all those things together, that's kind of our show. You know, it doesn't fit in any genre. It doesn't specify any specific topic. It's just what's the scuttlebutt today as it relates to the world around us. It doesn't really yeah. matter who and where and why. It's just let's just talk about it. You know. Well, I so us, I I looked up scuttlebutt to just because uh, you know, like I hear the name, I hear the term used, and I'm like, I don't really even know what that means so yeah. i looked it up the term and the term is to explore rumors stories and speculation in a particular area of interest hell yeah so that's it exactly really what it is it really worked i was like oh that's <laughs> rad so uh i'm sure you guys you probably knew that when you named it that or did you have another reason why you named it that uh yeah so myself being the mad scientist behind all, all of the creation i started this actually before without theron and without morpheus and when i started it it was what you know i this is what the essence i wanted to talk about and what i wanted the show to be about but yeah when i was thinking of the name of how i would name this i just kept recording and so i had maybe 10 episodes recorded and everybody the guests on those early days were like what are you gonna call it what are you gonna call it and i think even one or two of those have made it to air you know if you go way back when the audio quality is very terrible <laughs> um and i was just like i don't know yet man i'm thinking this i'm thinking that and when i landed on uh the scuttlebutt podcast it was exactly uh, out of the the sailor term which is to just hang out around the watering hole which is what we did every time we just drank whiskey drank beer and hung out in my barracks room even actually when it started so it was a very small cramped area horrible acoustics horrible mics and i was just sharing whiskey with the guys and i was like you know what this is kind of the watering hole this is exactly what uh sailors would do around you know way back in the day on wooden ships when referring to the scuttlebutt and so it was like what is the latest rumors you know did you hear about so-and-so got pregnant over on the carrier <laughs> last week did you hear about captain so-and-so who got caught with his you know junior enlisted is it you know so all of that rumor stuff is kind of that rumor mill is kind of what you know bred that essence again of like or solidified that essence if you will where i knew i wanted to be you know renegade and cowboy-esque and then i thought scuttlebutt really encapsulated that that mentality for us and then again two-thirds of us now being active duty and we have a lot of you know military members on the on the show it it definitely is a is a it, it definitely encapsulated it the way that i wanted it to so well it's, it's perfect reasoning. it's perfect because uh i what i tend to do is i tend to go and, and maybe you're the same way i tend to go first episode of a podcast like any podcast i'm checking out for the first time i go first episode and then most recent episode 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Just Mm -hmm. because I like to see the evolution, especially people that have a hundred or more episodes, you know, because generally there's a lot of uh, evolution and growing in that stage. And so I like to see that. And uh, the first thing I noticed was like the first episode was you. And then the last episode was multiple of you. And I was like, oh, my God, he multiplied. Uh, So anyways, uh, yeah, super cool. So uh, so I I just dig the I'm I'm kind of notorious for giving podcasts about 30 seconds and then I move on uh, Mm -hmm. if I don't like because to me it's all about the sound and the energy. uh, And if I don't get that in the in the first initial phase you know past the intro and all that shit you know conversation wise i'm like meh you know and then i move <laughs> on and so uh so i really enjoyed your energy even from the first episode uh oh. just you streaming your consciousness and then into the most recent episodes where it's all three of you streaming your consciousness and also <laughs> bringing in people and so uh, i just thought that was really great how you just stuck to what you were doing you just brought more people on board Hell yeah. Man. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, I absolutely do the exact same thing. When I was checking out your show, it was the exact same process, except I think I do it in reverse. I start with the most recent one and oh, okay. see, how, see where they've come. <laughs> because if their most recent one, again, same same criteria, if they have 100 or more and their most recent episode is still shit. Oh, then good I'm like, and then I'm like, hmm. Good and if point. I go back and it's even worse, then I may still, may still give it another shot. Maybe that was a bad last episode because I've, we've all had those. Sure. Especially when you're producing, you know, two or more a week. Yeah. Every now and then an audio level gets wacky or, you know, tweaks or the whole pre show that you and I were just troubleshooting beforehand. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> things just happen. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so, so I, I do that. And then I, um, and same thing about 30 seconds to a minute, you know, into the conversation, I'm like, all right, so what are we talking about? Who is the guest or what is the stream of consciousness? Are we going to link up and, you know, are we going to vibe out? And I, I totally agree. I, I had the same mutual feeling when I was listening. Uh, I think the first one that I, when you first reached out, it had been a little, you know, a couple of weeks that I had to listen to. And the first one was a giant, uh, Nefit. Nephilim, it? giants and Nephilim. Nephilim. There it is. There. Yep. It is. I didn't want to get the the uh, title wrong for any of your <laughs> listeners. They need to go back <laughs> and check that, that episode out. Yeah, because <laughs> it was great. And again, I, thank you. Audio and sound quality was great. I was like, okay, this guy's got to figure it figured out. I'm going to stick around, gave it a follow, gave it a like or a uh, rating. And I was like, okay, let's see what, let's see what Ben is all about here. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Yeah. That was Floyd Wills. He's a, an amazing author and researcher and uh, just such a fun guy to talk to. And I love conversations like that because it's so easy. Yeah. It's so easy because they're easy to talk to. They're so knowledgeable. I just, I, I thoroughly enjoy conversations like that. And, uh, and so that's the feeling I got from you. That's why I hit you up originally is because, uh, I look, I made the mistake multiple times of reading a bio, reaching out to a person, locking down the interview and then listening to their shit (laughs) and going, ah, fuck, (laughs) you know, what did I get myself into? And so now, now I'm like, okay, I want to check out some stuff, see, see what they do. And, uh, you know, reading through your information on your website and your bio and stuff, I was like, what is this guy about? Uh, (laughs) and then when I listened to the podcast, I was like, well, he sounds really good. I got to get this guy on and see, see what's going on here. But, uh, but that's the biggest reason is I literally, uh, one of the things I did in radio is I researched trivia questions for on air, uh, um, contests Mm. and so i got i got pretty good at like digging into things you know keywords and things like that and so i i uh i go through and i research uh try and just find good contacts that i can i can collect um so i just put these lists together of potential people i want to reach out to and so and then i go down the list and i check them off and so anyways you were on that list uh because (laughs) like i said i read the bio and uh, in my first mind, I'm like, all right, is he an alien? And then, and then in the, the second, I listen to the podcast. I'm like, well, he's a well-spoken alien. I got to, I got to get him on here and see. I've see been here a while. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, I've what's learned. the, yeah, what's the deal? Give me, give me the rundown. Like what, what is that all about with the, the alien thing? Hell yeah. Well, so it all started, um, Hermes Auslander. I, you said, uh, introduce yourself. And I was just like, yeah, this is my podcast. <laughs> Um, cause that's what I'm passionate about. No, yeah. um, the Hermes Auslander character, uh, 
came about when I was very young on this planet, I, I will say. And it was, uh, it was out of a um, need for anonymity or, a, or at least a, a need for like a, a shield, if you will, as it relates to a creative outlet. So, you know, I, I started more in the visual arts. Uh, I, still, I still do a lot of visual arts. You know, I do a lot of tattoos. I do a lot of graphic design. I do a lot of merchandise design, all of that stuff. I work with authors as it relates to illustrations. That's nice. always, you know, the really passionate side of the house. And, uh, and when I was doing that when I was younger, there was something I found out pretty quickly was people bring in their own perspective and not in a good way all the time to your artwork so they'll they'll they will they will have an idea about you and then they'll see something you did that clashes with that idea and then it ruins either their idea of you or it ruins their uh, ability to engage with the artwork you just created oh i see and so i you know and, and that was something i learn again I've, I've been doing art since i can remember you know well, since i could hold a pencil i've been doodling and drawing and doing something and it was yeah it was when i was pretty young they started you know started getting those little comments of like why'd you do this and are you okay and you know oh. like why so much blood or why so much nudity <laughs> or blah, you know <laughs> as a young kid i think dinosaurs is the big one so i used to draw a bunch of dinosaurs you know just like ripping each other apart or you know doing that kind of a thing right that's awesome i think i think like any young kid you know, is into dinosaurs at one point. You either, I think, or I've seen a meme out there of like, if you're a boy, you either pick uh, trucks or you pick dinosaurs when you're about four or five and you make your whole personality that for like yeah. four years, you know? That's true. That was that was me with dinosaurs. And uh, <laughs> so as I, as I progressed and as it continued, I started to, you know, get this idea of my head of like, how can I separate, how can I make people just see the piece of art and enjoy it or hate it or engage with it on an honest, objective, just neutral level. How can I do that? And right about high school time frame, I started doing, you know, some more writing. And again, same problem. I started writing things. People started engaging with it and started judging it based on what they knew about me already. And so teachers would love it for this reason reason, or hate it for this reason. My parents would say this about it or that about it, right? And um, and so that's about, I, was, I would say, middle of high school. I, I uh, ended up like testing out of high school and going into um, second into university, and right about that point, I was like, hey, "This is a fresh start. How can I do this?" Well, I'm gonna be just that quiet nerd person who does the schoolwork, and nobody like everybody leaves alone, right? That that can be what they see and appear and picture, you know, as their physical self. Yeah. But everything else online, I'm gonna have as this person, as this alien, right? And the idea why I stuck with an alien is that's kind of how it felt growing up, and how it always felt as it related to outlets, creative outlets was that I was an outsider, which is actually what uh, the last name Auslander translates to is foreigner or outsider or alien okay. in, in German. Yeah. And so I, I picked it, I picked little pieces of things of my life and I put them all together to create this idea of Hermes Auslander, the, you know, the, the foreign alien or the, the foreigner that is bringing a message of sorts, you know, whether it's in the writing, whether it's in the visual artwork, whether now with the podcast and spoken word, it's just how can you engage with that and objectively and, you know, and, and hopefully, absorb the the honest truth of it rather than have this uh judgment or uh, you know extra connotation with it and so that's where the alien aspect came from you know i love it i mean that's genius i mean it's genius to give yourself the persona of how you feel uh that's that's great i love that uh that's fantastic uh that's why i was so intrigued by it because you sold me on it like everything that I read, I was like, my God, this guy really thinks he's an alien, you know, <laughs> or, or he really is an alien. Like, that's what I'm thinking. And either way, either way, I was like, I'm in. <laughs> I want it. I want it to be one or the other. It doesn't yeah. matter which one. I just want it. <laughs> no, I, I dig it, man. That's why I, I thought it was so cool. And uh, <laughs> so when I when I read your bio and then I go and I listen to your podcast, the first thing I think of is that is not what I expected. <laughs> right I off the it. bat was like wow he he doesn't sound like i would think somebody would sound who considered this uh, themselves an alien i mean you know not that i know what that sounds like but you as you just said people make up their own pre-judgments and so i had already thought of what this guy hermes oslander is going to sound like uh and i just thought alien it's going to be alien i don't know but uh, I dig it, man. I loved it. So even in your emails, the emails back and forth, the language, see, it, it played into it. 
And mm. and I was like, I dig this. I dig this. <laughs> you know, I love that. I love that you uh, registered the truth of it. You know, that's like that's that's what I'm going for, and that is the honesty of it. You know, the yeah. or the authenticity of it is. I, I I don't want to project any specific thing. I just want to project me. And if you register that, you know, I love when we have a guest on our show, or if I get to guest on another show, where you just have that connection of authenticity. You know, you both have a connection there, and you're both on that wavelength or that vibe, and you're just like, okay, I get it. I get what you're going for. And and the uh, the complexity of it, I guess, of people is kind of what I love most about it. Because like you said, we all have that judgment. And if you're sitting here like reading the language of it, you're like, okay, this is definitely not a normal, you know, email that comes through. <laughs> yes. But it's, you know, it's also not, it's not, um, you know, it's not pushing me away. It's not, I'm not taking it back. So it's so yeah. the intrigue portion. That's the exact reaction that I hope <laughs> more people have with it so that, yeah, we can have conversations, sit down like this. And then when they hopefully listen, you know, cause I've heard that before. It's like, that was not the voice I was expected to come yeah. out of the bios you have out there. And it's like, good. I, I want that. I want it to be new. I want it to be fresh. I want it to be real and authentic, you know? Yeah, no, I dig it, man. I mean, I, you know, something that I pick on a lot when it comes to people talking about alien experiences and UFO experiences is that, there seems to be this need to fill in the blanks mm. where, where in my opinion, the blanks are what make it so unique. You know, like with mm. you, you didn't, you didn't like in your emails, you didn't be like, I am the alien Hermes. You know, it wasn't like that. You, mm. you, you stylized the email in a way that made me assume oh, this guy, this guy's alien. You know, he and might so actually be. <laughs> yeah. And so that's where I get hung up with experiences and in, in UFO encounters is it seems to me that a lot of people try so hard to ground it that it it's too on the nose. Mm -hmm. You know, it's too obvious that that it's uh, it's fabricated. And that, yeah. you know, and even though I don't know that because I can't prove that, that's just my gut feeling. And yeah. so, uh, so I think you played it right, but, uh, I love that it, it just so much cause that's what I do, man. I read stories and I try and, and, uh, and, and, and dissect them in the language and how people say things, not just what their story is. How are they telling this story? Yeah. And that has a big indicator of, of what the truth may be behind the situation. And so anyways, the language and everything, dude, I was super in. I was just like, God damn it, I love this guy. And uh, so anyways, but uh, yeah, and then listening to your podcast, I thought this is going to be really fun. <laughs> well, uh, seriously, I, I love I love hearing that and I really appreciate it. And it also goes to another like level of it where – you know, um, similar to what we were talking about before. Again, I don't know when you pressed record, but we, you know, we had touched on that idea of, you know, uh, of of uh, uh, broadcasting out there, and and you know, for the fuck of it, it doesn't matter, you know, yeah. who listens or doesn't listen to it. There's that, there is that uh, grat gratification um, if if somebody registers it and like sends it back. You know, of there course. is that similar to the universe. You know, if if, yeah. if we're sending all these signals out there, it will be very awesome, surprising, whatever, you know, as long as we're open to how it's received, which is another, you know, again, I could, I could ramble to an, an a, apologies for the tangents. It's how my brain works. Dude, I dig <laughs> but, it, man. <laughs> but it's, it's like the, the idea of, of being open, like you said, not, not necessarily grounded. You know, when you were saying that, I was like, yeah, that's usually because it's bullshit. You know, yeah. it's, it's somebody, it's somebody coming through with their own, like you said, thoughts and, uh, you know, feelings and their own lack of creativity. And that's something as UFOs are concerned that I totally agree with where, you know, when I first entered the conversation of, of what is or is not a UFO encounter. And I was very young and I was just, I was ready to believe everything. I was like, this yeah, me sounds too. amazing. Yeah. And then as I started to progress from there, you know, I saw the criticism of it. I was like, okay, that actually kind of makes sense now. Yeah. And I started going through that filter. And then I was very, very cynical of it. I was like, okay, obviously none of this is true. It's right up there with Bigfoot and everything else. Like, yeah. all right, fuck it. And then now I guess in the third or 30th phase of that cycle of back and forth, I've come to that <laughs> conclusion as well of, of, of open-mindedness where we, we don't know, we, we, we know so little about the universe around us and we have such a specific and small filter to experience it in that the amount of just possibilities, even if they're in just my imagination are so, so vast, if not infinite, that the likelihood that my imagination is limited already 
yeah. just goes to show you that everything outside of that imagination is probably, you know, again, so, so many extra levels above infinite or so many, you know, further exponents of, of, of possible that when it comes to something like an alien life form, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe the idea that I had when I was a kid and growing up and feeling weird was like, maybe that was the reincarnation example of that, you know, maybe, sure. or maybe even further than that, maybe just the idea of imagination and this crazy idea of UFOs and, and, um, and um, consciousness and experience is alien in itself or, you know, is or shared amongst other consciousness outside of earth. You know, all of these possibilities have, have, I've been, you know, open my eyes to. And if you had asked me when I was younger, I would have been like, no, that's bullshit. But seeing in the same vein that you're describing there of a less grounded um, story presented, that seems less earthly. I'm like, that seems even more possible than this guy saying, you know, I don't even know, like the little green men raped me or something. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm not saying that's not yeah. the case. And at the, it, again, if our imaginations can think it or, or, you know, uh, um, create it, Maybe, but all in likelihood, there's going to be all of this other stuff out there that we just have no concept or can never fathom that more than likely is where all of that exists in, you know, well, until look, we you, get to that level. You touched on several factors. You know, you touched on imagination, you touched on consciousness, and then you also touched on the external phenomenon that is UFOs and aliens. Uh, you know, this is this is why this topic to me is uh, was such a... a a free zone to be able to explore because we don't know fucking anything. And, and anybody who says they do is a lying sack of shit. And so, and that's what I highlight all the time. All these fucking people, these, these, you know, talking heads that are coming out and saying, well, I'm in the know, I'm in the know, I'm in the, you don't know shit. We don't know shit as the human species. We barely can comprehend our own fucking brains, let alone what's going on outside of our domes. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy to me that people just throw labels on it. I mean, our entire history is filled with things like this. People throwing labels on everything and saying, well, this is that and this is that. And then pretty soon time goes by and we're like, that's not correct at all. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, like this thing that recently came out. I don't know if you're, you've seen this where they basically have discovered a giant ocean underneath, underneath the, the crust. Yes. <laughs> Wait a minute. The graph that I grew up with that showed the breakdown of the planets and the layers that you motherfuckers were so confident that, that it was the magma and the manta and whatever the fuck that's called, um, <laughs> you know, all this shit. It's like you were just making that shit up. You really didn't know that there was a giant <laughs> ocean under here. You're just like, well, it can't possibly be an ocean. So we're going to mm -hmm. fill it full of the mantle, the, the <laughs> mantle, you know, well. Jesus. <laughs> Well, see, and that's the I love I love uh, the humor in in that and the lack of humility in that discovery as well because yes. what I I didn't I didn't explore all the articles but the first thing I thought I, I, let me restate that I didn't explore any of the articles because <laughs> I had the same <laughs> reaction that you had I was like really so another discovery that was kind of it's the same thing with the hollow earth theory you know yeah. again I'm not. I'm not a, uh, subscribing to any, and I would say being uh, – my background is biology. That's what I oh, went okay. to school for. I certainly lie heavy on the mathematics, the physics, and the you know physical side of the house. Yeah. And and so when I when I saw the headline of the, the vast ocean, I was like, yeah, it's called lava. And I was like, well, maybe it's not. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's not a lava ocean. Maybe yeah. it's uh, – yeah, maybe it's this uh, – I mean – yeah, maybe it's something new and exciting and crazy, right? Yeah. But the first thing I thought was, yeah, this, you know, tell me something that actually stuns me. Tell me something that actually I should give a shit about, right? Yeah. And that's, you know, and that's one thing that you see with all of these developments and discoveries of science is it just depends on what what interests you will you will give a shit about, you know? Yeah. And it's like physics will light me up every day, but nobody gives a fuck about physics. And honestly, at the end of the day, even if we discover the absolute you know perfect um answer for, and and unify all of the theories together it will change nothing about you and i conversing over this podcast it will change yeah. nothing about our day to day yep. it will just change a couple people's lives because they're the names who discovered that that's yeah. all it will do you know and so this is probably another good example of that is like did it change is it 
is it, did it change traffic today for me? Did it change, you know, scheduling for you? Did, no, no. Just because there's an ocean there is like, okay, great. Maybe there's some new, you know, uh, applications for uh, natural resources. I don't know. Germ- I felt the, the germ- waves, <laughs> Hermes. I felt the waves under the crust of the earth. I can feel them. We're getting, we're going surfing. <laughs> I would love it. Maybe there's some more real estate for us to explore and sell to each other. Dude, and, that would you know, be exploit great. Exploit each other for that, that would be fantastic. Yeah. More excuses to uh, to print some more paper. I don't oh, know, man. Completely. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's but, really what it's all about. Is that you know? I mean, that's what I found on your planet. Is that is what it's all about. You know, <laughs> it's not about all of the real experiences we're talking about here. It's about all of the all of the context in which we can use those experiences for our own betterment and gain that mean nothing to us after we're done here. So yeah. it's just this very finite finite portion of experience. That's what matters most. Let's focus on that. That's right. Well, and, you know, going back to the imagination and the consciousness, you know, and what we're what we're even capable of of being aware of as far as our as you said, we we have a limited uh, funnel in which we we take in information. And uh, it's fascinating to think that the the whole supernatural, paranormal, uh, UFO, alien topics, all of it, which I just I just say is all one it's all connected because it, it's all energy, in my opinion. And so uh, what I find interesting is along with these sightings, whether it be paranormal, uh, extraterrestrial, or supernatural, it, it's also dependent on that person's consciousness and imagination and what they've been fed in the past uh, that, that helped form that idea that this is. Uh, I had a great conversation with a guy uh, today, in fact, uh, over in uh, Pakistan, I believe. And he was talking about the fact that, uh, you know, that there's all kinds of different beliefs uh, of, of types of creatures, giant, whether it be giants, whether it be uh, genies like jinn. I don't know if you're familiar with jinn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's all these different things. And he said, basically... We're fed these things early, early on, these cultural uh, markers and highlights of different things that may exist, may not exist, whether it's in lore or in real life. And that feeds what we believe in the future. And so he had asked me, he said, do you believe that somebody um, will believe in an alien if they've never seen an alien before? If they've never, you know, like will they believe it's in a phenomenon or will they apply it to something in their world? And I said, well, you can go back to biblical times and see how uh, they said it was a wagon wheel and a chariot that was flying in the sky as opposed to an airplane. Mm -hmm, They had no imagination that could tell them that there would eventually be flying machines. Um, So they had no concept of a flying anything except for animal birds, you know, whatever. So they applied a a land, uh, exclusively land a vehicle as a wagon as though it could fly. Mm -hmm. And so we have this, that without the imagination and without something to feed that imagination, we don't have the capability to come up with these things on our own per se, necessarily. It's fed from cultural, you know, it's fed from, from these ideas that have been rooted in and even subconsciously, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, what is it that they call special, uh, intuition mm-hmm. or something like that, where, where a species can actually, uh, uh, pass on memories, even, even through the DNA genetic memories. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Genetic memories. They've done this study in rats where they've, mm-hmm. they've uh, taken them through a maze and then another generation of mats were able to go through the exact same maze, having never been through it before. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Incredible. And, 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 and to the, I mean, there's so much, there's so much there to unpack as well as it relates to, you know, the context or the filter that you perceive that we perceive. And we're just going to stick to one species. We'll stick to humans right now. Right. Yeah. The, we have so much, so many layers to, to consider so many variables to consider when you're talking about just a single sliver of time. Right. You know, if we want to exclude, you know, the math for a second and the physics for a second, we want to exclude all of that and just talk about subjective experience. Right. Yeah. Uh, language, right. Forms the brain, in which you perceive the world in and it can, and it can, um, and again, study 
multiple studies have been have been shown to, you know, like whether it's versus a uh, bilingual um, upbringings versus, you know, a, a solo language household, uh, whether it uh, is a specific area of the globe, you know, as it relates to, you know, um, to weather, you know, uh, climate around you in your upbringing, as well as uh, the, the structure of school, all of these things, right? form the brain that you have up to the point of that ex subjective experience, right? And all of those are completely out of your control, the same as your DNA is, right, with yep. your ancestors and everything. And if you if you take all those variables into one specific subjective experience and then you extrapolate the experiences of all of the other variables around you that are not you, you know, the people you talk to, the uh, house you're building, or, you know, the person, the baby that you're creating, you know, or the relationship you're in, all of those other, you know, butterfly effect, you know, um, chaos theory is a, is, is what describes this phenomenon, yes, right? Exactly. Uh, this is, it, it becomes such a, you know, mind boggling array of variables and, and, you know, impossibilities, if you will. And, uh, it, it goes to, it goes to show even the things that we're, we're talking about here and we're describing here is all based around English language that you and I both understand is both is based around, you know, the country that we both grew up in. Like you said, if it if it's talking about aliens, for example, you know, if we don't have the language, the context, the, you know, the um, comparison to make to anything else that we have around us. We'll find those comparisons to make, whether it's a chariot, whether it's a bird, whether whatever. Right. And currently most people forget that fact in everyday life. If yep. we talk about the UFO phenomenon now, the only thing we have to base on is all the years up to this, the language that we're all working with right now, and currently we label it alien, you know, extraterrestrial, something off world. But all of this experience, all of this context is is leading up to this exact subjective experience and maybe even shared experience that we're all trying to make sense of. And it, it is filtered and it is colored through all of those experiences and all those variables leading up to this point that we had no control over. But here we are. And if we forget the fact that it's probably not correct because it's probably not the whole picture, it's probably only partial, you know, part of the picture, uh, the humility. I mean, some people might fear it, but part of that process is the humility to realize, like, just stay open minded, stay aware, stay objective about that. You know, again, why I go back to that Hermes character is because just take all of those colors, all of those filters, all of that context out of it. What do you get? You know, what are you actually experiencing? What are you actually perceiving? What are you actually hearing and reading and listening to? You know, just if you stuck to that and, and yes, it's subjective. Yes, it's it's colored through that. But if those are things we can't control anyways, why are we bothering wasting our time with it? Exactly. Just try to be honest and authentic with it, you know? Yeah. And I think I think we could. You know, we could be on a much, much better area or level playing field if everybody was doing that. If everybody acknowledged that fact instead of, oh, well, it doesn't fit what I think religion means or it doesn't fit what I think, you know, the economy should should look like. And it's not going to make me any money, this ocean under the crust. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, how do you, you know, if, if we stop trying to put those filters on it or those, you know, constraints on it, I think we would have a much more, you know, fluid and dynamic and, and cohesive um, uh experience around us you know i agree i my my place that i am most comfortable is agnostic mm -hmm. meaning i don't know shit man and i'm not gonna pretend to know shit i'm gonna tell people what i know and what i think but I, i'm never gonna be like well i know this and i know <laughs> that this is and that's what bothers me about a lot of these people that are saying this you know, like, oh, yeah. well, I know for a fact that fucking drives me insane when Jeremy oh, Corbell yeah. gets anywhere and says, <laughs> I know for a fact that there are these programs. I know for a fact these crafts. I know for a fact, dude, you don't yeah. know shit. You're a journalist that's talking to a government spook. What mm -hmm. the fuck do you know? You don't even or, know if he's legit or not. He's just exactly. telling you he is. Yeah. Corbell, that's, I love that you brought him up because I have such, I, I like the conversation he has started or the conversation that has sprouted because he's out there. Sure. But every time I listen to that motherfucker talk, I can see nothing but bullshit. I'm sorry. I, like you said, I've, I just have 
like there is a there is a frequency that you hit of that that registers as authentic to me and he does not ever hit that i don't know what it is about is it feels like a showman it feels like a magician yes. trying to sleight of hand you or something yep. and again i'm really glad we're talking about ufos and everything you know in the mainstream of but course. i almost think he's a fucking spook or something like he's a plant you know sometimes uh, because he just is so fucking fake to me dude look man you if you're a journalist and you're just sucking down the fucking goop that this government spook is feeding you. You're a fucking government spook, man. You know, whether you know it or not, you're a government asset. And so right, this, yeah. look, we have uh, one of my favorite examples uh, in the world is Richard Doty. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with this guy, but he goes back to old school ufology and there's a, a story involving a gentleman named Paul Benowitz. Are you familiar with him? I can't say I'm I'm looking up Richard Doty right now. Yeah, He's so a PhD professor in psychology of uh I don't know if that's the guy. Uh no? <laughs> R- Richard Doty is a former government spook who uh was uh, he claims to have been a part of the basically what people say are the men in black. Um uh, and that what the USG he was, is that what this is? Is that what I'm reading here? What's the that? USG it says that he used to be a member of this corrupted portion of the USG deceiver and murderer of yes. American. That's American. I think so. Yeah, Richard Doty. Uh, well, look up Mirage Men, the documentary Mirage Men. You'll find him, and then you'll find everything about it. But the the whole documentary is about him, and what he does is he goes through naming names of people they fed disinformation to, and one of them was Linda Malton Howe, which is a major name in ufology. Uh, another one was uh, Paul Benowitz, who who was a, a guy that was coming out very strong about UFOs. And the story goes with this, and everybody should check out Mirage Men. I'm telling you, if if you have any questions about this and what, what the government's capable of and how far they will go to feed disinformation, this movie highlights it. Uh, but Paul Benowitz caught on video because he lived near Area 51, and he would regularly film the area. And he caught uh, two, as he described, two bogeys hovering over and kind of flying over Area 51. So he called the base and told them, not that it was alien, not that it was UFO. He said, you have bogeys over your base, and I just want to let you know. Well, what Richard Doty says in response to this is that what Paul Benowitz had captured was actually highly classified secret government technology that they were testing over the base, but they didn't want him to know that. So instead, Richard Doty, on the word of the CIA, was sent to Paul Benowitz along with Bill Moore, who was another big guy in ufology, and they both came out talking about this. This isn't just me saying it. They admitted to this, that they were sent out to intentionally feed Paul Benowitz disinformation reinforcing that these were UFOs and alien, not classified government technology. And this goes back to the, I, I want to say like the, you know, mid eighties, early nineties. So this is balls deep, modern ufology. Mm-hmm. And this is the beginning of all this. And so they, they intentionally fed him to the point where he drove himself crazy, chasing this idea and ended up losing his wife his entire family, house, and committed suicide. Fuck me, dude. Yeah. Uh, well, n- nothing about that, nothing about that surprises me in any way. I mean, exactly. If you, if you go down. I mean, being being uh, active active duty right now, the small and I'm and again, I'm nowhere near the top levels of CIA or anything else. Right. That's I'm what a government lowly, spook would say. I'm sure they would. Right. <laughs> I'm the like the lowest of lowly enlisted <laughs> personnel, right? You're never going to convince bare- me, Hermes. You're never going to convince me. <laughs> I infiltrated the military thus far, but it wasn't easy, I will say. And <laughs> let me tell you, they would never let an alien go higher than where I, I'm at. I so. love it. I love it. <laughs> but but uh, one one thing that I have found going down a couple of these rabbit holes is it really? I mean, why I brought up my service is even in the baseline super low and listen why we're anonymous now is because talking about something like politics or religion is already so fucking hush hush there for the longest time just saying who you fucked and didn't fuck you know have you know uh, the uh, don't ask don't tell policy that the yeah. military had you know all of that goes to the very core um uh, sentiment that is that it 
that exists in in the bureaucracy of the government and and that is no nobody this is segmented this the only way the parts and machine can work is if they are doing just their job they cannot be looking outside their their wheelhouse their gearbox they need to only exist in that gearbox so that they can connect with the following gear and continue spinning it has these the teeth have to line up if the if the teeth are swaying a little bit to the left or right Nope, too bad. You know, that's that's bad for the machine. It's going to start clogging the wheel. You know, the cogs are going to stop spinning. So if, if we're using that, like, super simplistic analogy of how the machine continues to run, it makes sense why it can't sway left or right. I, I, so that all that makes sense. And when you go down some of these rabbit holes as it relates to, like, Tom O'Neill's book of, um, oh, of chaos. chaos. Yeah. When I, when I got through, not even halfway through that one, I was just like, I'm not surprised, but I'm still shocked that yes. this is actually true. Yes. And when you think about like MK Ultra and and the idea of disinformation and and um and influence, spe- specific conscious intentional influence that that men in suits sat around a desk, assuming I I don't know what where they were sitting, wherever <laughs> they were sitting, and decided, look, this is what we need to do. It in it involves. Drugs. It involves sex. It involves murder overseas, uh, uh, abroad, and at home. We. This is what we need to do in order to achieve our objective. And yeah. they all said, "Yep, that checks out. Let's do it." And this thing span was, you know, over the span of fifteen, twenty years, uh, you know. And who if knows if it ever again, stopped? If it ever stops is a great point, <laughs> but officially documented as you know, starting and stopping at this fucking huge timeline and as we're talking about chaos and but chaos theory and the butterfly effect the amount of ripples that that had in our society that we can kind of see in today you know 70 years later that we can see as no that's probably where that this is coming from or this is probably likely where this stems from imagine all the shit that we're not seeing all the shit that is in intentionally driven for that specific purpose or a specific purpose again that we are just not privy to not aware of it 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 again for myself and you probably wouldn't surprise if we if we were you know if we were made aware of it but at the same time it's still outside of our imagination so yes it's still fucking surprising that these these internal you know fights and wars are are still these feuds are still continuing to go on and everybody goes about their day and nobody knows and nobody's the wiser, you know, and 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 then when you start to peel back some of these layers, because, again, I hadn't heard the names you were. And again, I'm not deep into UFO, UFOlogy or the sure. UFO community. But as you start listing these names, you and, and you know, that I'm unaware of, you know, I start doing a quick Google and you either see, oh, this person was a quack or this person was, uh, you know, uh, discredited as, you know, this and this. And then you you named uh, Paul, was it Paul uh, Benowitz Benowitz? committing suicide and it's like nobody takes their own life because a their life is perfect and going well yeah. and that makes me very curious as to why and what was happening and was it a suicide because so many suicides now jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself uh was you know th- begs a question as to what's actually the the motivation if it is a suicide why if it wasn't a suicide who the hell is responsible for it and why yeah. do they care so much to silence somebody like this and that's something that you know, not to get dark on you, but a lot of these conversations, discussions lead to is this weird darkness that a lot of us, it's its way more fun to say little green men, right? Yeah. So if somebody is out there spewing, you know, in today's, uh, um, you know, conversation as it, as it relates to like the gimbal, for example, or like a lot of these, um, a lot of these videos that are circulating out there, it's easy to put Jeremy Corbell out there, who's, you know, this animated figure who I call bullshit on. You know, but he says it's little green men and he knows for a fact, but he can't quite tell us just yet because it's yep. not this, that, the other. That's a lot more fun than than peeling back some of these other layers that probably have something on the level of like MK Ultra or, you know, uh, or some other black op out there, you know, what the X-Wing or something out there that, you know, isn't a squeaky clean fun story that led to that, you know, place. You know, it's 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 way easier to do the, to do the latter or to do the previous. So yeah, if I, w- if I was to guess in the same vein that you're describing here of this disinformation or, or redirection, you know, again, magicians, you know, love misdirection for a reason. It works, you know, and it works every fucking time thus far. Yeah. I, that's where I would put my money as well. You know, unfortunately. 
Well, look, I mean, here's here's my argument all the time about the alien question. And uh, so I hope you're not offended being an alien. But here's <laughs> here's the thing is this is what I always say is I have solid rock concrete fucking proof that my government is evil and bad and things that they've done in history that are just that. OK, <laughs> and I don't have nearly as much evidence to back up the fact that aliens are doing the same shit. You know, that people want to say, oh, it's aliens that are causing the strife and the, uh, you know, the, the turmoil on our planet. And they're, you know, we have these 57 different alien species and some of them are good and some of them are bad. And either way, they're stealing your socks and they're giving you wedgies. And <laughs> and I just think, look, why are we why are we diverting attention away from the evil fucks that really do exist that are Absolutely. causing us strife, that are causing us pain, that are legitimately fucking with our lives, stealing our socks and giving us wedgies. <laughs> when instead, uh, you're saying that there could be, you know, a 57 different versions of Sky Daddy out there that are doing the same thing. And, and so I'm the like... reptilians. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, and even though I want to believe in all of this stuff, I, I am more, I feel stronger that I really don't want these motherfuckers to get away with what they're getting away with by saying it's the aliens that are doing it. Mm. You know, instead, like, I don't want to say that it's a reptilian creature that's, uh, that's, that's making Nancy Pelosi inside trade. You know, <laughs> no, I'd rather say that evil cunt is stealing, is a traitorous bitch. Uh, and let's blame her for what she's doing you know not a not a not a reptile creature that's doing it so in my opinion that it's partly this i don't want the people i want to give credit where credit is due and mm -hmm. and so like i said when i look at the evidence of who's doing what i got a lot of evidence that shows that it's humans doing this shit to other humans whether it's abductions yeah. experiments kidnappings uh all kinds of things that people are saying aliens are doing and and i'm like i i as you had said i go with the data and the numbers and the numbers are on the side that it's <laughs> us fucking with us uh as opposed to an alien race out there but what are your yeah. feelings on that well that uh, my feelings are exactly what i think you're getting at and it doesn't you know similar to the ocean under the crust that i the, you know and i said did it matter did it affect our day today that we saw that headline? I think that's the sentiment we're both getting at here is it doesn't fucking matter if Nancy Pelosi is a reptilian or just an evil bitch. She's still inside of trading. Yeah. She needs to be stopped. That's the thing that I'm talking about. Here. Yes. And that's what I think we're both talking about here is if somebody, you know, if somebody breaks into your house, I don't care what gender, what race, what background, anything else. If they break into my house, they are an intruder in my safe space. Yeah. I will I will I will approach them and deal with them in the exact same fashion I would if it was a alien, yeah. if it was a monster, if it was fucking Bigfoot or Boogeyman or anybody else. It's it's an intruder into my safe space. And and you know, as as we develop or as a situation develops, you know, hopefully we adapt to it. And I, th I to the point of, you know, is it 47 different races? Again, it doesn't fucking matter. You know, we can get to that question, you know, if it's if we have the downtime and people are not intruding on our safe space yeah. to, to answer whether or not it's 47 or 48. You know, again, the irrelevance, the, the irrelevant nature of that portion of the conversation does not interest me the same way that an intruder interests me in my, you know, and, and I think to even go one step further of the conspiracy put on tinfoil hat and add one more layer do it is i i think that's intentional i think yeah you know anybody who is in a position to sit around and wonder what could be the next distraction or what could be the next intentional influence or you know how can we turn this knob and lever up this way and turn this one down is because they don't have that immediacy but they know that you and me and the common person who's just trying to get to and from work, live out their life and love their loved ones does have that immediacy of an intruder in their house. And as long as we can keep them right there, right on the cusp of not quite an intruder, but they still have the need of an of immediacy of an intruder, we, we got them. So if it's UFOs or if it's, you know, reptilian Nancy Pelosi or, or <laughs> satanic baby cults or whatever – if, you know, that's going to be sufficient because nobody can prove shit. It probably isn't true and doesn't fucking matter. But 
it certainly heats people up. It cer- certainly heats up the conversation. I mean, even to bring it back from from the conspiracy, but as it relates to, you know, like the current conversation of gender or even gun control currently after the latest tragedy, yeah. the latest mass shooting, you see so many different actors and factors and variables just flooding into the conversation that have nothing to do with what just happened. There was a tragedy, you know, or there's somebody who's, you know, uh, confused or upset or, or, or just reaching out and trying to understand just like we all are the world around them. And you see this flood of narrative, you see this flood of variable, you see this flood of money and influence and power struggling and, and none of it fucking matters at the end of the day. Right. We're, we're still trying to just talk about the one fact of the matter which is life and death and tragedy and loss and you know and how we're going to deal with this it's not about you know is this going to you know, earn you political points on the next fucking election or something you know yeah. like that should not matter but yet if you can if you can turn it in the right way or spread sh- you know shine the right light on it it will matter to you and enough people will care in the right way to seem like it does matter or the Twitter boss will be up in arms over something, you know, cause you program them to be so, and you can, you know, you can shift this little misdirection into the realm or the, or the, you know, the neighborhood that you want it to exist in. And I, I, I expect that's exactly what we're talking about and why I'm on the same vein and same boat as you are is like, that doesn't fucking matter. What actually matters is, Insider training, corruption, you know, power grabbing, you know, suppression and censorship, you know, suppression of the First Amendment and censorship as it relates to these, you know, podcasts and pirate radio. Like all of that stuff is what matters to me. You know, I haven't had a break in thus if, thus far, but if that happens, guess what? I'm, I'm going to care about that a little bit more than what I just listed off. But until that happens, that's my main concern, not reptilians, not satanic baby cults until – the evidence shows that that's what it is, you know, or yeah. that's what it, I should worry about, you know. I'll tell you what, uh, the di- the one difference between if uh, if some random person breaks into my house or an alien breaks into my house is, one, uh, if it's an alien, I'm taking pictures with it after I kill it. <laughs> that's that that's the only day otherwise i'm with you 100 percent. i'm reacting the exact same way but one i'm taking a selfie the other i'm burying in my backyard so that's just <laughs> <laughs> that is a great point assuming that that alien is physically bodied yes. and able to be shot and killed of course of course <laughs> exactly just exactly. like bigfoot is a dimensional uh fifth dimensional being that transitions in and out of this realm right? <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know it, it, it it's funny that you you know uh, that you talk about the corruption and all that because one of the biggest clues to me that the modern ufology uh, uh, search and investigation is just a giant money laundering scheme is the fact that you have all these talking heads uh, championing a $748 billion defense budget bill just so we can get a sliver of of an avenue so people can report UFOs better. <laughs> so you have the entire UFO community going, rah, 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 let's give the government more money. And and behind it is just this tiniest little uh, little avenue. And, and even uh, one of the congressmen that has come forward, you know, championing this bill and all this stuff, recently came forward and said, even if we do have an avenue, the stigma is not going to go away. So what the fuck is the point? Yeah. Well, I think the point is exactly what you suspect and I suspect it is, is it's not going to that. It doesn't fucking matter if it <laughs> yes, ever did. Exactly. You know, and 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 being, you know, um, again, having having a little bit of experience as it relates to logistics and supply yeah. in the DOD alone, they, char- you know, on paper, it says it's four hundred dollars for a stapler. But that was from Staples. You know, they <laughs> they pick that up from Staples. That's our contractor is, you know, the the enterprise that owns oh, yeah. Staples, you know, like it all. All of these things have an NSN number somewhere, a VIN number somewhere, and they're all worth five cents. But they yeah. charge us four hundred dollars for it. It's because they needed, you know, three hundred and ninety nine ninety five to go in these other spaces, these other realms, right? And yeah. all of these, you know, and that's that's how you got MK Ultra. It wasn't because it was free. It wasn't because yes. people worked for free, you know. And as it relates to a lot of the technology, we ultimately, or or hopefully, end up receiving as it relates to the internet because the internet came out of like a, a dod project you know communications project yeah when we when you and i are existing now and having this conversation out of one of those projects that 
fruited what you know and it, yeah fruited what it fruited uh i consider it to be you know almost like collateral damage or just like um like runoff basically when well these as bob ross says it's a happy accident happy exact there's a good one yes it is it is exactly that most of it though is not a happy accident it actually leads to the same place all of these things lead which is to death. It's the same thing you do when you're doing uh, clinical trials. I work in medicine. It's the same hmm. thing you do when you are testing something for the very first time. You test it on something you don't give a shit about, right? You test it on a lower life, quote unquote, lower life form. And nine times out of 10, you kill that lower life form and it dies. And that's the part that nobody likes to talk about, but that's yeah. what happens. And then when you find the one success where it didn't kill them, but it crippled them unimaginably, then you start from there as your new baseline. And then you try it again, and again, 9 out of 10 of the next one will be horribly disfigured and unabashedly crippled, but then there's going to be one that's just slightly less, and you work from there, and that's how you build up this practice of medicine. And, you know, that's how we've done a lot of medicine, unfortunately, and that's how a lot of the government, a lot of these projects, you know, before they lead to a happy accident, or you know, if they ever lead to a happy accident, lead to that ultimate conclusion of death, destruction, and demise, but... Again, as long as we're printing paper, then it's probably kind of okay. So if we charge four hundred dollars for one single staple, then that's kind of the, the the collateral, the cost of it. But yeah, I mean, I, I think the I think it's good to suspect otherwise. And the biggest issue that I think we're all that we're having, especially as you and I are talking about this, is there's no consequence. You and I have consequences, but most of the further up you go up the chain the less and less consequences you have and yeah. the more extreme shit you can do. I had a conversation um, with a, a buddy of mine. We were, you know, um, when, when you stand watch, there's nothing to do but sit and talk. We oh, hope sure. nothing happens, right? So if nothing happens, it's very fucking boring for 24 to 30 hours, right? So for 24 to 30 hours, you're just sitting there drinking coffee. You got to talk. One conversation we got into was about morality, whether or not it's, whether or not money impacts morality like do you do you start out a psychopath or can you become a psychopath because you have the ability to do so right sure. and as it related to um when we were overseas one thing that you see is like people with just just on just sickening amounts of of wealth right and the things that they ultimately do like the um hussein brothers right yeah they, you know they would they would feed prostitutes to animals or to chimpanzees or you know and just just unbelievable shit yeah and even some of the lower people who are just like billionaires in that country right that's considered to be like somebody who's just middle class here you know if you're a billionaire in some of these places you're middle class right yeah but that you still have access to basically whatever you want right so does what do you do at that point you know what and, and when you get past that middle class area what do you do with your time you know you could do anything and everything you want nobody can tell you no uh what do you do and and we went back and forth of well maybe you just you get you get so bored you become psychopathic because nothing does it for you nothing hits that button you and i can do a podcast and have an engaging conversation and that does it for us and i'm and i assume there's plenty of billionaires out there that that also can do it for them but there's also maybe that broken person that it doesn't do it for them or maybe you get to that point where you've done all the other things again i've never been in that position you have never been in that position so maybe we'll do a million podcasts Maybe we'll travel every country of the world. Maybe we'll eat every food that exists. Eventually, there will be run, there will run out of buttons that we can press. Does that mean that – does that lead us to this conclusion of psychopathy or sociopathy? Maybe. I don't know. I'm, again, I've never been in that position. But we, it was a very interesting conversation as it related to, you know, around this idea of morality. And I think ultimately, given an, enough people, enough time, you know, and that's what the that's what the human race is, is if not just one giant clinical trial of humanity, of yeah. what it means to be alive. Given enough time and enough people, there will be those that lead and answer that question. I think we're kind of getting there, right? Yeah. Seven, eight billion people. And of the seven, eight billion people, point zero one percent of them are in that space. And what do we see all of them doing? We see them subjecting everyone around them or, or less than them or lower than them to exactly what, what I'm outlining here of, you know, of whatever is going to push the button, you know, you know, there's this, there's this, um, trend that tends to happen, you know, um, as it relates to like pornography, where you push the envelope further and further and further, yes. and further you know, or film further and further or, or music or whatever. 
and if that's our natural default habit as a species, yeah, 0.01%. If you have everything, you have every resource and every, what do you do? What other than you have to find a new means of pushing that button. If that means starting a new world war or, or starting a new MK ultra project or creating a new, you know, panic around UFOs so that you can continue mining, you know, whatever precious mineral that you found is, or you deemed as precious this, this, uh, millennia, because, you know, we have cell phones now and previously it was oil or previous before that is gold, whatever it is. That's our, if that's the default level, then the only, I don't know, the only way around it or the only way to stop it is, is recognizing that as, as earnest, authentic, and truthful rather than being slide, getting that sleight of hand pulled on us, you know? And you see it so often. I I don't have the solution for that. I don't know that anybody does. But like we see it online. We see it in this conversation that we're having here. You know, we see it in in the military. We see it in the government. We 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 feel hopeless and helpless against these forces because it's nature. It's it's default. It's it it is what it is. So many people say, or or like that's just how the government works. You know, we can't change it now, or it would take too long to change it, or just. And insider trading, you know, those that can change it are the ones benefiting from it. So what can we, you know, it's just, there's the, there is that default setting and sense, you know, and I think I'm, I'm coloring this through my own experience of living in the States, living abroad for a while, living in the States, having a new perspective about the government, uh, being military, all of those things are coloring this rant of mine. (laughs) But so many other people out there are doing the exact same thing in a different context, whether it's religion, whether it's, you know, um, just a single household as it relates to, you know, a patriarchy or a matriarchy, you know, wherever those exist. So I, I, I think it's just like this default setting that we're all just trying to evolve past probably, or most people are, you know, in the process of evolving past, but here we are, time is relative. So we're experiencing the hundred thousands tens of thousands of years that that evolutionary process millions of years that that evolutionary process takes place you know yeah single-celled organisms didn't have a say when they were absorbed you know as mitochondria but here we are nonetheless you know benefiting from their sacrifice i'm sure the story will continue along that trajectory you know well i uh, look i mean i think what you're touching on is humanity i mean this is i think what happens is, is, you know, and we live in a culture, this is what I see a lot. People are more and more comfortable shedding their, or not even, not even recognizing their or someone else's humanity in a given situation. We, we are so quick to be able to just dehumanize another person because it's easy for us. Um, something I, I worked in retail for a long time, customer service. And to me, this is the greatest small scale social experiment that you can have of the people's humanity. Uh, You know, I worked holidays and holidays is all about happiness, you know, and all that stuff, except if you work in customer service. If you work in customer service during the holidays, it is hell on earth. And the reason why is because people don't give a fuck about another person. They want what they want. And it's all kind of shrouded underneath this idea of, of joyfulness and happiness. Because as soon as they leave the store, oh, they gain their humanity back. But to me, a good social experiment is when someone has zero obligation to be nice, to be courteous, respectful, zero obligation. In fact, not only that, they have the advantage on the other person where they know the other person can't criticize them for their lack of humanity or anything like that. Given that situation, watch how people respond to these people. As you had said, they're lessers, you know, and a lot of times the person behind the counter is considered a lesser. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they're serving you for the five fucking minutes that you went in there. And so to me, it's, it's very indicative of people willing to shed their sense of humanity for any given situation. And I think what happens is, is a larger scale, because mind you, I'm talking about a seven fucking 11. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a grocery store, a gas station where people will rip someone a new asshole because they gave them the wrong change Mm -hmm. or whatever the fuck, you know? So now you take that to a larger scale and you're dealing with billionaires who not only do they have zero obligation to be nice to the person behind the counter, they literally don't have to answer to fucking anybody. 
anybody, like you said, 0.1% on the people on the planet have a say in this guy's life, right? Mm-hmm. And, and what they, cause they're that big of an elite club, your humanity, given the person, not only that, it takes work to maintain yeah. your humanity. It takes work. So the average person that walks out of their house and doesn't even think about it, how they're going to, you know, handle a situation when things don't go the way you thought. Um, and then you just lose your shit because you're responsive and you just don't even think about the humanity of the situation. Um, like I said, on a larger scale, it, it takes effort to try and connect yourself to the average human because you're that far disassociated with them. Absolutely. And so that that's what I think a lot of times what happens is that, you know, I mean, look, it happens with in every stage. You have people that are yes men, people that go around you and they support you no matter what. And in some cases, that's great. In some situations, if you're if you're an artist, if you're somebody who's trying to find yourself, you want people around you that are supportive of you and supportive of what you want to do in your dreams and your hopes and all those types of things. But if you're a moron and you're kind of a dick, you should also have people around you that go, hey, dude, don't be a dick. You know, instead of a whole bunch of people around you just going, hey, man, you're great. And that's what a lot of times they, these people have is they just surround themselves with people that give them constant positive reinforcement. It doesn't matter what they do. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so you can see this all over the place, examples of this. Uh, and so I think it really just comes down to, you know, I, I think you touched on is just people, people are just have no sense of humanity. I mean, what's a common phrase? I hate people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) right Mm -hmm. how many times do we say i fucking said it six times today driving (laughs) from 30 minutes i mean you know i said said, i fucking hate people uh (laughs) and so i mean that's a very common thing but also it's indicative of just the fact that we've completely lost our sense of humanity yeah you know i I, I, yeah no I i think you definitely hit it right there and that's what that's one thing that the conversation you know with my buddy on watch didn't touch on is i think uh, as as you get there it becomes effort you know once you get to that i think that's perfect uh, in a nutshell that's exactly what it is everything in our lives take effort right yep. and you and i have our effort and our attention you know uh, pursuing and divided into s- so many different things right and that's that's what's true for our reality but when you get to that portion that position what left is there except the effort to look at your fellow man and you know who the fuck wants to do that you know well and it touches on what you said also about consequences right you and i we have consequences if we go out in the real world and are a dick to everybody we come across yeah you know if i go to my my local grocery store and i call linda a cunt enough times behind the counter (laughs) i'm going to gain a reputation of being a real prick yeah. Right. And now exactly. it's going to be unlikely that I'm going to want to not only do I want to go to that store because I'm going to be mistreated, but also I have the reputation of mistreating other people. So I'm not going to be welcome. So mm-hmm. it's going to affect my my daily life being a, a total asshole. But you have people that, again, they're so disassociated with the average human experience that it doesn't even matter if you're an asshole. You still have a majority of the world that doesn't give a fuck. It, yeah, and you can go wherever you, you know. And I'm curious I, I, if, if I was to ask you, like, wh- how how would we? Uh, the essence is how would we fix it? But I'm curious more of as the conversation around UFOs, around society, around politics is concerned. Um, I I don't know. I I heard someone say, well, we need you know aliens. We need that big brother. We need this cataclysm. We need this reset. We need this thing to fix this. Yeah. I don't, do you think, cause I have my own opinions and thoughts on that. Do you think that will fix it? Do you think that will fix humanity? The aliens? What, the, whatever, whatever you label it is. Cause some will say, well, we need aliens to come down and show us how small we are. And that some kind of existential together. something. Sure. Exactly, exactly. Whether it be yeah, a comet yeah. and whatever. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, no, it won't. Because human nature is human nature. It doesn't give up. I mean, you can go back to hunter gatherers and you're going to find some asshole in a tribe that was trying to manipulate shit. Uh, The difference was he had such a small tribe that they kicked his ass. 
You know, that's the difference. And, and, but you can see how people, I mean, look, this is where monarchies come from. This is where kings and emperors and all that stuff is what, what happens? People start following a person for whatever reason. It, it could be a billion reasons why somebody starts following someone else. But, but really, it comes down from word of mouth. Someone vouching for someone else. What stops that person from being a follower? It takes someone in that chain going, hold on, this guy isn't all he says he is. <laughs> hold on, let's look into this guy. You know, so you got to have someone. This is my argument against big government is, uh, you know, and as military people, of course, you know, if I cross a line, please tell me. But um, no lines. <laughs> thank you. But, uh, you know, this is what I say is I don't think there's room for big government anymore. I think if you're going to fix this, one of the things you could do, you're never going to change human nature. You're never going to change human nature. So with that, we have to have parameters of, well, well, what can we handle within this human nature? And that is we cannot handle huge communities. We can't do it. We've proven we can't do it. They can't sustain themselves. It takes too much from the areas that aren't big enough. Mm -hmm. it's, it's too much. So, so one, within human nature, we cannot handle these large uh, urban areas. Can't do it. Uh, we have about, to be able, what's that? Go ahead. What, uh, what about, um, I guess what specifically about the large, cause I get what you're saying about, let's say like large urban areas mm -hmm. sucking the resources from those around them in yeah. order to sustain them. The, the worst case of this is in the middle East, right? Where there's no water, there's no natural resource there outside of oil. So yeah. oil brings them wealth so they can buy all the resources they need to sustain themselves. Right. So that is the that is the most the the clearest example of this. What about that specifically? Then, it, it, are you saying we can't do or or, or we, you know, because I I don't I don't, I agree with you, but I don't necessarily. I wonder if I agree with the thought process. I guess or the, sure. or the train of thought to get there. You know, I here's how I feel about, it. and I'll give you a much more domestic example. Okay, mm. uh, you can go to Detroit. You can go to uh, California, you can go to New York, you can go to a lot of places and find absolute dire straits poverty. Mm. And, and why is it that in these areas that aren't, don't seem to be super separated out of these large areas, they're kind of on the outskirts. What's, what's happening there? Resources are being pulled further and further from the outside into this giant hub. Uh, and so, I mean, look, like a big example around here, Lewis Clark Valley, uh, Idaho and Washington area, we have a lot of grain farms, a lot of wheat farms, right? Mm -hmm. Do a lot of grain stuff. Very little of it stays in the area. Right. It gets shipped off to much larger areas that don't have farmland. They no longer have the ability to farm these things. So they have to pull from the other areas, Right. So right, right. I feel like just in human nature, we don't do well being stacked on each other. We just Agreed. don't yeah. do well. It, it creates violence. It creates corruption. It creates a lot of things. So we just can't be stacked on top of each other. I'm not saying that there's a limit, like, you know, 500,000 people. I'm not saying any number. I don't know what it is. But clearly, in my opinion, there, there is a point in which a community has gone so has gotten so big it's unmanageable. And that's where I feel the corruption from the people that say, well, I can help you. I can manage this gigantic problem. I can manage 500,000 people. How can one person or even 12 people mm -hmm. manage 500,000 people? And a lot of times that's a small number. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Compared yeah. to the amount of people that are in charge of a city, of a state, of a country. So sure. it's just not feasible. And so with corruption, they come up with ways to make it more incentivized to lead the country. Well, we need bigger incentives to get people. If you want people to do the job, we got to pay them well enough. If you want people to do the job, there got to be perks. Yeah, and pretty yeah. soon those people are deciding what those perks are. And then we as a people, because we're unmanageable and we can't manage the situation, me and you can't manage a city. So we say, well, the elected representatives are going to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, so well, it, it's this whole effect of, and again, I'm not 
putting a solid number on it. I'm not one of those that's for depopulation <laughs> in any way. I think there's plenty of space on this planet, in my opinion. And I'm yeah. a dumbass, but in my dumbass opinion, I feel like I live in a rural area. We rarely have traffic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I don't feel overpopulated. But yeah, I know yeah, yeah. areas do feel overpopulated. When I go to Los Angeles, when I go to these big city hubs, they are, they do feel overpopulated. That's not a global problem, in my opinion. Same with the food shortage and stuff. To me, it's it's not about, like, the whole world is starving. Clearly, the whole world is not starving. Sure, it's that yeah. resources, as you had said, are being pulled from one area to give to another area. And so I think if we get back to, look, it all just comes back to, we have to have humanity. People in a lot of times, we, we say this all the time where we're at, people go, ah, fucking Seattle, they make all the decisions mm -hmm. for us. Well, because they're a gigantic city that has more voters. Yeah. So they decide what happens for the entire fucking state. Mm -hmm. Well, what's good for Seattle might not be great for us. And so that's kind of the idea is like with smaller communities, well, now you're more accountable to the people that live near you. You're more accountable to the people in your community. Not only that, you're only funded by the very key point here. You're only funded by the people around you, meaning you have to be results driven. You have yeah. to be. I mean, you can't look. I mean, again, going back to if I'm a dick in my community, well, everybody's going to know I'm a dick. You know, exactly. but people in New York aren't going to know I'm a dick. Yeah. And so yeah. that we got to we got to shorten that distance so people know who the dicks are. And, <laughs> and, and really, I mean, that, you know, that's really what it comes. And so there is no in my opinion, there is no room for federal government anymore, at least not the way it's structured uh, I, right right now. And I, and, I can't agree with you more. Yeah, absolutely. And, and especially as it relates to d downsizing, if that's the term we want to use or or uh, fat. Uh, fracturing or, or, you know, however, cause I've heard a lot, you know, and I've, I've dabbled back and forth with, you know, like local, like, um, anarchist, uh, I guess mentalities or even, you know, a, a, a Morpheus likes to label it as, um, as, um, libertarian even, you know, there's a lot of these, you know, ideas and uh, fuck it. The, the U S was started at, out of these mentalities of like, look, this is the system that we're in. We don't fucking like it. We yeah. need a different system. So currently, I think we're in that transitional period. I couldn't agree more with you. And when when you when you um, when you said that you know there is like you're not for depop uh, depopulization, but there is some sort of limit. And certain places certainly have found that, that limit where yeah. you're either sucking resources out of all these other places in order to s sustain yourself and you're hating each other in the process of living on top of each other. And there's this abject poverty every, I mean, a big portion of, you know, what I do in, in the medical field is humanitarian efforts to parts of the U S that are, are without basic, you know, medical services, you know, and, and it's talking, shocking sometimes it's shocking oh, to go to areas and see what they don't have. It's mm -hmm, in absolutely. in the U S it's incredible. And it's like, look, I'm not, I'm not naysaying or, or dis, dis, uh, agreeing with the fact that in the middle East, there are absolutely, you know, poverty and, and, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of horrible things, but we have a lot of that going on here domestically i mean we absolutely have people that are starving in the u.s which blows my mind it, it blows it should, my, yeah. it should blow your mind because you have an idea you have a dream quote unquote the american dream that we were all sold as kids as being possible and what we were all striving for and and there's this i there's this um good uh, down the rabbit hole series uh, on youtube um I don't know if it exists anywhere else, but one specific one it highlights is uh, the mouse utopia experiments, and specifically it relate it it it, um, it displays rather. Oh, I think it, I know it's this. Sh it's shocking how much it correlates to humanity because there is a certain threshold where rats are very happy, very cooperative, very commu uh, communal with each other. But once you pass a certain certain threshold, 
something weird happens. That's right. And no matter how you design the city that they're living in, no matter how you de- the environment they're living in, no matter how you design um, their resource management, no matter how you design their hierarchy, no matter what you know form quote unquote of government or what you know, because again, we're, this is an experiment that we're imposing our you know our variables restricted uh, you know um, experimental variables on them. No matter where where and how they did it, they could only get to a certain point before shit started to collapse, shit started to get weird. You know, there would be an alpha that would start fucking everybody, even yep. though he was, you know, infertile. He would start killing even his mates, and then he would start maiming himself and pulling out his own hair and going crazy. There is a certain limit to where things get weird for a species. Yep. Humanity certainly has to recognize that we are no, that we don't possess the ability to supersede the natural order as it relates to something like that. We have our you know, our own, um, inherent nature. And if we, and again, I'm not trying to say we need to go back to the good old days. Yeah. Me neither. Because I, I think there are a certain set of, 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 um, technologies of systems, uh, of, of, you know, whether it's politics, whether it's government, I think there are a certain thing, a certain set of things currently that we enjoy that are possible but I think as it's currently set up, we had a we had a guest on our show um, by the name of Eric Mason. Shout out to Eric Mason. He's an economist, and he was uh, he proposed, and it, it wrinkled my brain when he did it. He proposed the question of is uh, capitalism and is wealth possible without poverty as one of the foundational factors that prop it up? Right? Can you have someone like you and I talking on? Uh, a, a piece of technology, a computer, a microphone, you know, with a roof over our head and, you know, uh, and food potentially either in our stomachs or out, you know, within arm's reach. Is that possible for everyone across the board to have or is that only possible because there are those that we don't have immediate access to that are not in arm's reach that we can, like you said, dehumanize and be OK with dehumanizing? As the foundation for this capitalist society is, is it, you know, is one dependent on the other or are we just currently structuring it around as such? He argued that currently we're structuring it that way, you know, as it relates to, you know, technology, let's say transportation, you'd lay, you, you said L.A., New York, uh, Chicago, Austin. Those are all the four corners of of the U.S., right? Do we have the ability to travel those places? Yes. Do we have the ability to travel those places relatively cheaply? Yes, assuming you're above the poverty line. Yes. Yeah. So we we acknowledge there are there is this there's this um, gradient of existence that I would say a majority. I don't know what the, st- the the statistic off the top of my head is, but let's just assume it's around a third of the population, if not two thirds of the population in the U.S. can achieve those modes of transportation, right? then we, just like the internet, can establish that those are almost necessities. Running water, like, you know, and again, there are parts of the U.S. that don't have that, which is shocking. It can be shocking to people who don't see it, but there are plenty of places that don't have drinkable or running water. Um, Access to food and resources, right? If we acknowledge that those are almost human rights, just like, you know, in the inalienable rights that the founding fathers set out, hope you know, ideally, as we like to assume in the American dream, set out to deliver and provide and ensure are protected to all the citizens of this this nation. If we acknowledge that there are some other ones that they left out, maybe you know, yeah. it's not just the pursuit of happiness, but it's also the access to this or that, right? If transportation is one of them, is is access to technology as it relates to like communications, as the internet is c- concerned, or as um as uh, education is concerned, especially for the youth, you know, uh, good education, not you know <laughs> what we currently have is we're one forty one fifty seven, I think, in almost every area across yeah. the board, you know, uh, if if that's what we strive for and are assuming is the basic level, there are ways to restructure what we're currently doing. In order to ensure that it, that it happens, does it mean that you and I may have to um, restructure our own lives? You know, we, we're so spoiled here. That's one thing I've noticed when I went overseas. We're so spoiled here with so many things that we complain about now because we're spoiled with them. Yeah, fuel being one of them, right? You know, the average uh, the average um, uh, price to heat a home is you know X, right? But X is so much smaller than Y. 
abroad. Same yeah. thing with our cars and our transportation systems. We're all so accustomed to the size of our SUVs and our trucks and everything and the fuel efficiency of whatever car and the price, you know, as, as price per gallon goes up over here, it's, you know, it's like three fifty, you know, average across the board. I don't know, maybe four dollars average across the country. That is so much cheaper versus the metric they use abroad that, again, the metric abroad is kind of like subsidizing and supplementing this cheap price that we're as the empire of the the American empire is used to, you know, um, enjoying the spoils of, of, of her empire. Right. Which is low gas prices. So even if it goes up a quarter, we're like, oh, my God, that's so much. Yeah. But again, we're so used to all of these luxuries that any any change of variance is, you know, we lose our minds. If it was if it was restructured in such a way that those were made to be the most, you know, appropriate or the most essential I think, and again, this is not an overnight solution by any means. Again, I'm not the solution, man. I, like you said, my dumbass is just talking, you know, for, for, uh, stream of conscious here. Yeah. I'm just knowing what I've read. I've known what I've heard. I'm knowing what I've seen. And I've seen quite a bit of the world now. And one thing that I have noticed is the structure of things, the structure of a community, of a culture, certainly plays way more into the happiness, utility even, of its population than any other overarching federal government, any overarching country patriotism could ever satisfy. And that's one thing that religion used to satisfy when we were, like you said, 10, 12, 20 people, a tribe. We knew who the dicks were, and we had these questions of, you know, why does the sun rise and why does the moon set? You know, that's the question we – that's the, you know, the existential crisis we had at the time. We've now moved into, an, into the day and age where potentially – there is a technologically driven, created, and born God that might exist within yours and my lifetime in the form of AI. Yeah. And we are <clears throat> confronted with that existential crisis, and yet we are still existing and structuring our communities, our countries, and our world around something that is extremely primitive and completely devoid of that existence of that God existence. You know, so if, if, if AI said tomorrow, you know, and I've, I've argued this quite a few times now over the last probably year that we are in the singularity right now. Sing you know, time is so relative that we like to think the singularity is a single point in time of a millisecond or a single second or a minute. But time is, is if you wrap your head around what it can actually, what it is and what it can actually be, the singularity could be a thousand years. We are within the singularity right now as it relates to the expansion of this. And especially as exponential growth is concerned, AI is on that trajectory. We're yeah. there. Technology is there. You know, we are, we're already cyborgs with all of us having a cell phone in our hand, in our pocket at all times and all days. So if you're, you know, scared of Elon, Elon Musk's um, Neuralink, you know, you're behind the curve already of that exponential growth. Yeah. So I've argued that that singularity is occurring right now and, because of that, I think if we, if more people were to recognize that as this current situation, even if it is 500 years from now that, you know, AI God is actually born, just because you and I don't see it doesn't mean you and I can't recognize that that's where we are. That's what's happening right now. Exactly. It could be, it could be 500 years, but it could be five minutes. It could happen in the, in the span of this conversation. And if that is the case, recognizing the flaws and faults, the same thing why we're anonymous on our show is – Bringing light and casting light onto some of the shadowy parts does not mean that the whole system is a failure. It doesn't mean the of whole course. system of the military I disagree with. It just means that just like a person, we need to be honest with ourselves about what we're lacking so that we can grow, develop, and, be, and better ourselves. The only reason I would ever shed light, you know, there's a saying of loose lips sink ships. I yeah. Find it, it's so bullshit because <laughs> – the only re the only way that we're going to keep that ship from sinking is if the lower decks tell the upper decks that there's water coming in right that's now. That's right. We got to figure out how to get this water out. You know, yeah. that's what a big portion portion of our show is about. Is like, let's shed light on some of these dark, shitty water. You know, ta taking on water portions of of our ship so that we can expel it and better it and keep afloat. I I want it to keep afloat. To your point of federal government as it's structured right now is just not functional. It's too big. For, it's bloated. It's all these abs of fucking lootly. Should we have um, the ability to defend ourselves as a country? I think every person should have the ability to defend themselves from the, from their, 
from the very basis, the very basic level, which is your hands and your fists and your brain. Yeah. You should be smart enough to reason your way out of any situation. You should be strong enough to fight your way out of any situation. And if all else fails, you should be able to look to your brothers and sisters to help you out of that situation. Anything further than that is just fucking bullshit. It's, uh, it's just a fucking you know, mental gymnastics and political bureaucracy gymnastics that is, is using mis, uh, sleight of hand and misdirection to, to prop up their own agenda, their own money-making machine. It's, it's bullshit. Plain yeah. and simple. There's no better word than it's bullshit. You know, so I, I that's the simplest way I could ever say that we could get out of and get rid of the flood that's currently coming onto our decks, you know, to put it to sailor terms. You know? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, to go back to the question that you posed to the guy about can can uh, capitalist uh, capitalism exist without poverty, uh, I think is what it was. And mm -hmm. look, here here's my here's my argument about this. You know, we mentioned, you mentioned before, all the variables that go into a sighting, an experience, right? All this type of stuff. It's the same idea about this. There's so many variables that go into why capitalism works and doesn't work. There's all kinds of variables about this and why there are people in poverty and why there aren't. A big aspect of this is, is simply that there are gatekeepers to resources. So it's not just about... There's not, you know, like the are one of the argument that we had talked about is that, well, you have impoverished people while at the same time you have all these people that have all these resources. What's the pro what can we do to distribute? And a lot of people say, oh, well, we have to have, you know, equality and we, uh, you know, equality of outcomes. So nobody should have this much and everybody should have this much. The issue is, is this, we have groups that keep technology that would benefit humanity to have free energy to themselves. So it's not necessarily that people, um, that everybody can't, I mean, there, it is a situation that nobody can afford the power, right? Uh, I mean, so there's areas that don't have power because they have no money. Well, with free sure. energy, that's not a problem. Sure. Okay, so you fix that. Uh, with food, uh, it, the truth is, is that if we had waste conservation going on to, to minimize the waste that goes into um, very uh, privileged countries like ours. If you had waste management that distributed that to people who, who needed it, well, then you'd have a lot less starvation. Uh, so it's not, in my opinion, it's not necessarily like you had pointed out. It's not that the entire government's bad. It's that there are gigantic rotten chunks that have that have made it to where we can't trust a lot of what's going on. They're they're you know doing all kinds of secretive things, and I think a lot of the case with the money, with the energy, there are secretive groups that are making it out as though there's scarcity, when really there's not. The same thing with money. There's people making it out like there's scarcity of money. Well, how come these countries don't have money? Well, that's because you have uh, feeding America, one of the top groups that supposedly feeds the hungry makes 2.9 billion dollars a year mm. okay you got no kid hungry another group that supposedly feeds kids they make 36 million dollars a year mm -hmm. you got meals on wheels 389 million dollars a year so what you have is this is you have now people will argue well that's how much money it takes to solve hunger well True then how come the end. fuck we don't have it solved <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? It's that big of a problem that it's just a constant bill. What the, you're out of your fucking mind. Mm -hmm. There, we can 3D print meat for fuck's sakes. You're telling me <laughs> there's a food problem? Jesus Christ! No, what it is is as you had said, it's a class system problem. Is yeah. that it comes down to where there are a class of people that think that we and other people don't deserve to have it. It's not about that. There's not enough. It's that they, they have blocked off certain areas. Think about the amount of land that's owned by the government. Fuck you. You know, yeah. like, like uh, open that shit up. They, they expect hotels to give up their land space when you have BLM that just owns forests. <laughs> Fucking do something, man. Build some tree houses for fuck's sake. So, you know, it, like, let's do something here. But no, it's not relying on them. It's relying on us. So, yeah. you know, they can print money out of thin air, but they can't feed it to the impoverished communities. No, they got to give it to overseas. 
It doesn't. Well, that doesn't help you if we feed everybody here. What does that do if we feed everybody here? Exactly. It fills oh, it improves belly. health. It, uh, it 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 makes people gripe less. It makes mm-hmm. people le- fight less if everybody had food. So no, they got temporarily. Gotta- well, uh, it, yeah. it gripes them less. It fills the stomach, you know, temporarily, and maybe it sets a new standard that a that's possible. So now we can stop bickering that it isn't possible because look, it just is. And then now we have a new. We can set our sights on something new. There's a there's another great uh, book slash pamphlet. It's pretty extensive to be a pamphlet, but uh, Gene Sharp from Dictatorship to Democracy it outlines basically everything that props up a dictatorship and how you dismantle it peacefully, right? Um, one thing that it it points out and that you're pointing out here is uh, is this idea of of um, illusion, I guess, if we will, or delusion, right? It's only – any any power structure is only as strong as those that give it the power, right? Yes. And, and that's exactly where we're sitting here is we all are acknowledging – we said it earlier. We're all acknowledging that this system has its faults and isn't working yet. You and I are still talking right now. We still have internet. We still have electricity. So we are able to distance ourselves from the problems to a degree. Even if we, again, you and I are still bitching and complaining and moaning about how fucked up it is because it is fucked up. But it's not so fucked up that you and I are in a box right now or yeah. a cardboard, you know? Yep. So it must be working good enough for me. It may be, you know, the class system may be so bifurcated and so distant that – you know, I'm never going to see, you know, a million dollars or a billion dollars or anything else. I'm never going to eat caviar off the stripper's tits on a yacht in the Mediterranean. But if one guy is, and that means I have lights on in my house, maybe it's okay. Maybe that's, I agree. One home, you know, so it's like, yeah, this, this, I don't know this trade off. I had a, I had a train of thought there and I, it's right there. It's on the edge of my, it's on the tip <laughs> of my tongue, but it's like, yeah, it, it, at the end of the day, man, it 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 comes down to like I I often just shrug my shoulders of like I don't yeah. fucking know. Well, because the problem is so big, the problem is so big. Yeah. I don't think the answer is what I what I disagree with. I I had a I had a, a a not really an argument, but a disagreement with a friend of mine. I'm over at his house one day, and uh, we're talking business stuff, you know, and then eventually goes into politics and things like that. And I don't like talking politics, but, hey, if you're going to go there, I'll go there. And so anyway, so he starts talking politics, and, uh, and he says, I just don't think there should be billionaires. There's no reason for anybody to be a billionaire. And I said, I don't know, man. I don't want anybody telling me I can't be a billionaire. You know, if I have the potential and the ability to make a billion dollars, motherfucker, I want my billion, you know, but here's the difference. I'm not going to step on people to get it. So I don't think it's, it's a matter of, or at least I tell myself that now. I would say right now, you don't have a billion dollars. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Right now that I got $12 in my pocket, I would never become a douchey billionaire, but, (laughs) but uh, I think it's even more arrogant to say that nobody should be one. You know, like, look, dude, without billionaires, look, you just touched on it. Without certain billionaires, there wouldn't be as much innovation as there is. And so if it wasn't for million dollar companies being able to do what they do, you know, we're on, we're using basically free software to do what we do. Virtually free software. And how does that happen? Through tech millionaires and billionaires that invest in the technology so the consumer can use it for free. And so, so I definitely don't think I'm with you. I do not think in any way we should limit anybody. And I don't think that's what it's about. I think what it's about is other people saying like, look, a a big argument of mine is that the whole UFO UAP topic is a diversion for what's really going on, which is secret technology within the government. And that this secret technology we've had, we've had physicists working on anti-gravity since the thirties. We've had, we have free technology, free uh, energy in our cell phones right now. The fact that you can put your phone on the charger wirelessly, that's free energy. Okay. You can put a, you can put, you know, those little pads that charge your phone, you know, wirelessly. You can do that. That's free energy. It's applying all that. So we have this energy, this, this technology, we have nuclear powered subs that spend 30 to 50 years in the ocean and never have to refuel. 
So why, why is it that people don't have energy? Why is it that people don't have enough food? Why is it that people don't have enough money? Because there are people that are making sure they don't. There are people that are making sure that we, the people in the United States, have just enough to not revolt. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, so I think a lot of times what you have is you have oligarchies, you have social big societies, secret societies sometimes, and, and absolute elites that, as we had pointed out, that at the douchey level of being a billionaire, you can, you can actually sway who gets what. Or you can at least fund... Uh, the mechanism that determines that. Absolutely. And so I think a a lot of times what's happening is, is we get stuck on capitalism. Capitalism isn't bad. It's a tool. Mm. Uh, You know, technology is a tool. It's not necessarily bad. What makes it bad in the hands of the person who is a dick bag? You know, that's what makes it bad. So, so technology in the hands of humanitarian, well, now you would have humanitarian innovations, Right. But when you just have people that want to make money, this is why the light bulb works for four hours mm-hmm. instead of, you know, 40 years that we know that they can. Exactly. So it, it's designed. It goes back to as as you know, your friend had pointed out, your guest had pointed out. And it is true. It's the structure of how it, how it's structured to be. But we have to remove those incentive mechanisms that keep people wanting it to be this way. Instead, we have to develop incentives that reward humanitarian moves as opposed to people just hoarding money and not allowing other people to have it. We got to give them incentive to do that. You know, look, I'm not going to out. I'm not going to go handing out one hundred dollar bills to everybody I think needs help. That's an uneducated approach to the problem. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's really what's happening. They're just handing out money to anybody who asked for it. So what we got to be is we got to be discernible about it. Of course, you're going to have people bitching that they didn't get enough money. But sorry, you got right. you got to try. Yeah. I mean, the, there's a whole reparations conversation going on in California right now. Mm-hmm. And and it, it and same thing with the homeless uh, situation. And I think it. It is an exact cherry on top of both misdirection and misinformation, but also to the fa- also to the point of structure. You know, I, I remember that point that I was thinking of was right there on the tip of my tongue, and it was the idea that you had brought up a little while ago of of waste. Right? Have you ever gone to the uh, dumpster of a restaurant just out back? Yes. The amount of waste that wealthy countries produce, and you know, some countries. Have um, have take have have noticed and taken you know uh, actions and legislation to prevent that waste. You know, yeah. France is, is is one example that I know of. Iceland, I think Norway. You know, as it relates to you know like fresh fresh foods, vegetables, etc. Just because they hit that expiration date and they weren't or they were bruised that day does not mean that they're useless, right? Yeah. And and you see any restaurant dumpster in the states. We don't have that legislation. We don't have those programs. And, uh, you know, there was St. <laughs> Patty's Day is a good example where I was waiting for a buddy to come up. The wife and I went and grabbed some of those green donuts. We passed by the dumpster behind Krispy Kreme and it's box after box after box after box of just. 